This is Paul Kalai Nui, and you are listening to Hawaiian Potpourri. I understand that this evening, uh, today is the 29th day of April, there's a gathering at the, uh, not Haoleko, Haoleko Hotel in Waikiki. <laughs> And it's of us graduates from Waianae High School over a period of 10 years. I'm not sure exactly where the 10 years begin and end. I think it's from 59. Uh, actually, 59 was when the first, uh, oh, when the school opened, I think. No, when the first graduating class came out in 59. And so 10 years after that is up to 1969. I fall in between. Uh, so I'm the in-between guy in 1964. Uh, so first, I want to uh, greet uh, all of our uh, schoolmates from Waianae High School in that that year, and uh, uh, I hope to be joining them this evening after this uh, radio show, and uh, perhaps see some old friends and maybe some old enemies that I can now make friends. <laughs> But aloha to uh, all of you who have uh, uh, come to that uh, gathering and uh, many of you who have uh, returned uh, from America back to your homeland. Uh, aloha to you. All right, if you would like to call and share an opinion and maybe set me right on some of my opinions with regards to GMO or with regards to education system and education philosophy and things like that, telephone number here is 524-1080. Even if you don't need to set me right but you are in agreement with me or just want to make comments about some of the comments I've made, call us and uh, we'll put you on the air and have you share your opinion with us. Okay, the next item I wanted to share with you actually comes out of uh, this morning's uh, newspaper, and it is found at page A3, that's Nation and World. So I wanted to talk about uh, some of those things. And uh, the first matter deals with uh, Al-Qaeda, terrorism, and uh, what really is the threat? And, you know, I heard a program at 3 o'clock, I think it was about 3 o'clock this morning, uh, and it was a guy named Ted Engelhardt, and uh, I forget who was doing the interview, but in that discussion, it was very interesting, and I found that uh, I was in agreement with uh, everything that I can remember now with what they were saying. And uh, I think he, this guy, Ted Engelhardt, writes uh, Ted's Dispatch, is it? And uh, one of the points that he made is that if you take a look at how many murders, either through drug deals or robberies or what have you, that has occurred in the United States, it's by the thousands, if not the tens, or maybe even greater than that, thousands. Traffic accidents, also thousands and thousands. With regards to murders committed by Al-Qaeda terrorists, not a single one in the last year, two years, three years, maybe even five years. Not in the United States. And yet, when you compare the amount of money being poured in, for security against terrorist organizations. They're, of course, in a multi-billion dollars. And the, the budget is hidden in so many different ways, not only in the black budget of the CIA, but in the military budget and in, in these specialized uh, trainings and, and the rest, so that it's all over the place. And there's so much money being poured in, and people are making a lot of money out of the fear of terrorism. Just as others were making a lot of money out of the fear of nuclear weapons on the other side and so billions of dollars had been spent and continues to be spent on the fear of nuclear weapons and on the potential the saber rattling that I've talked about of perhaps we should attack Iran on the possibility of their moving to create one nuclear weapon when the United States has stored 
thousands of nuclear weapons and have spread out nuclear weapons across the world and gifted to Israel hundreds of nuclear weapons. This kind of idiocy that continues to pervade the U.S. through its media, through its White House press corps, and through the uh, Pentagon's news releases, and reporters who go there and simply repeat what has been reported. This marketing of fear. You remember the Cold War, the marketing of fear? To distract our attention to a different area controlled by those businesses, those industries that are profiting from fear. So there is that fear industry that continues and it, and it jumps from place to place and it creates this image of something that we should be afraid of and then we need to protect ourselves from that which has caused wars such as the Iraq war the Afghanistan war and many others of course the event that occurred on 9-11 2001 was not a mere creation. It actually occurred such that planes struck into buildings. We saw that. Buildings crumbled. We witnessed that. But taking that stark, or those stark facts, into consideration, and the number of people who died now we begin to investigate and build an understanding of what had occurred. And there we have those people who control the media, those people who control the politics, those people who control the storytelling, stepping in and hiding evidence, getting rid of evidence, creating new evidence, new stories, so that we buy sort of lock, stock, and barrel the interpretations, the translations, the myths created. And they know that we're going to buy it because it's a clear explanation, it's a simple explanation, and it is an explanation based on the fears of the people. So what we need to do is somehow clear our eyesight, clear our mindset, clear the illusions that we continually get thrown at us and be able to pierce more deliberately, more intelligently behind the scenes, taking a second glance sort of, at what is being reported and ask ourselves about the truthfulness, the falsity, and who's getting rich out of what the people are seeing or out of what the media is seeing. Here's a news article. The new Al-Qaeda. It's written by Kimberly Dossier, and I'm sorry, and if you have the opportunity, you might want to Google Kimberly Dozier, D-O-Z-I-E-R, because at times it seems that, oh, this is just another reporter. But you can take a look at the history of this particular reporter and see how much in bed with the military-industrial complex she and others are with. And then you can more deliberately judge her reporting. But she reports out of Washington. A year after the Navy SEAL raid that killed Osama bin Laden, the Al-Qaeda that carried out the September 11, 2001 attack is essentially gone, but its affiliates remain a threat to America, U.S. intelligence officials say. Core Al-Qaeda's new leader, 
Amen al-Zawahiri still aspires to attack the U.S., but his Pakistan-based group is scrambling to survive under fire from CIA drone strikes and lying low for fear of another U.S. raid. That has lessened the threat of another complex attack like a nuclear dirty bomb or biological weapons, intelligence officials say. Al-Qaeda's loyal offshoots are still dangerous, especially when Yemen's Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula or AQAP, while not yet able to carry out complex attacks inside the U.S., such groups are capable of hitting Western targets overseas and are building armies and expertise while plotting violence, according to senior U.S. counterterrorism officials who briefed reporters Friday. So you see what is happening? These so-called experts, these so-called uh, intelligence officials, counterintelligence officials, and they wrap it all up in terms of this specialized agency is now warning us, but essentially playing on the fears and promoting the whole idea of fearing on that basis. I'd like to see an article. I'd like to see trained reporters and if you have the opportunity go train yourself as a reporter <laughs> to look at the issue from a different way to say and this presents an opportunity for really using peace as a method to bring about better relationships let us use some of the funds that had been set aside for this great military buildup and the fear mongering that is going on. Let's take just 20% of it and build academies of peace in which we can have a number of different campuses, in which we can have an intermixture of people from different religious beliefs. Uh, we can bring the mothers and the children of victims of injury to different parts of the world and getting to know one another and start building this academy of peace. In that way, you can build your foundation for a long period of peace relationships. At the present way, all we are doing is continuing with a DIE approach. We are dominating the scene, we are dictating, we go into countries and other countries at will without apology, uh, as if we have every right to. Imagine if other countries, such as Afghanistan, such as Iran, said, hey, are we not entitled to carry out the same kind of aggression that is being carried out against us? And as a result, if they had the capability, Iran could fly their planes over our skies under a demand that we should not be shooting down their planes. They can create drone flights and fly them over our airspace and we would have no right to claim sovereign, uh, sovereignty over these airspaces. If they could send some of their people into the United States and set bombs to scientists and their children and just blow them up because they are associated with uh, research, either GMO or nuclear research, and the U.S. would have no right to appeal, just the way it has happened in Iran. So it gives us pause to consider, well, suppose we were treated in the same way that we are treating others. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. What happened to that golden rule? 
But now is the opportunity to start taking a look at it, to uh, look for those reporters who are able to report from that perspective of building peace rather than uh, rattling the sabers for more war. The second thing that caught my attention in uh, this morning's news article is found at page, let's see, page A4, dealing with Islamabad, dealing with Pakistan. You know, Pakistan has called, well, let me just read the article, uh, and this one doesn't carry a... The byline of, of the writer, it just says New York Times. The U.S. spurns Pakistan's call for an apology. The latest high-level talks on ending a diplomatic deadlock between the United States and Pakistan ended in failure Friday over Pakistani demands for an unconditional apology from the Obama administration for airstrikes. The White House, angered by the recent spectacular Taliban attacks in Afghanistan, refused to apologize. Now, what difference does it, has to do, does it have to do if they were angry about being attacked when they're in Afghanistan by who they claim to be that so-called terrorist organization, the Taliban, against the... Uh, Pakistani government. Okay. The Obama administration's special envoy to P Afghanistan and Pakistan, Mark Grossman, left the Pakistani capital Friday night with no agreement after two days of discussions aimed at patching up the damage caused by the U.S. airstrikes last November that killed 24 Pakistani soldiers on the Afghan border. You re may remember that, that you have these soldiers protecting their borders from uh, in Pakistan, protecting it from Afghanistan people uh, sneaking over the borders. The United States sent a, a flight of, I think it was drones, and shot up the, the border guards and killed 24 Pakistani soldiers. Both sides insist that they are now ready to make up and restore an uneasy alliance that at its best offers support for U.S. efforts in Afghanistan as well as the battle against some extremist groups operating from Pakistan. The administration had been seriously debating whether to say, quote, I'm sorry to the Pakistanis satisfaction until April 15 when multiple simultaneous attacks struck Kabul and other Afghan cities. So the Taliban are playing with the Americans and the Pakistani government and they sent out an attack. They know that discussions going on in uh, Pakistan, in Islamabad, is not going to go well once the attack happens. And uh, just as predicted, this is exactly what happens. In the meantime, the United States keeps the, atten uh, the tension very high with the Afghanistanis. Uh, I'm sorry, with the Pakistanis. The Pakistani is saying, hey, if that's the case, then good. Don't come through our border in order to get to Afghanistan. Go take the long route. And the Americans are saying, but that, that takes us, it's about, what, 10 times the expense. And, you know, it's very expensive to bring uh, down the supplies and, and the rest. And the Pakistanis are saying, well, too bad. All we ask you for is an apology. And even that, you refuse. It's interesting how the arrogance of the Americans are manipulated by the Taliban's, insisted upon by the Pakistani, and held to this outrageous righteousness that the Americans claim that they have, that they should not apologize. Of course you're supposed to apologize. You struck and killed 24 innocent soldiers protecting their borders, and you shot them up uh, through your drone flights, and you don't want to apologize? Sounds just like uh, when the Ehime Maru uh, practicing its show off uh, on how this uh, submarine, the USS Greenville, could pop out of the water 
and just like a dolphin and then flop back down and when they did that there just happened to be a ship above them which was a training sh ship from Japan with students and, and other trainers on it the Ehime Maru and it killed the students, it drowned them and there was uh, no real attempt by the submarine to save them as they were drowning in the seas. Now there's some reason why they didn't make the attempt but that wasn't the issue. The issue was should there be an apology and there was no apology from the United States until a long time later. So what happened? So we from Hawaii uh, held ceremonies and, and shared our uh, condolences to the people and we had Hawaiian prayers and took out the uh, hokulea and dish, uh, threw flowers and other things into the ocean where the events occurred. But it's this American arrogance that stops the United States from its relations with others. Okay, continuing on with, with the readings, U.S. military and intelligence officials concluded the attacks came at the direction of a group working from a base in Pakistan's tribal belt, the Haqqani Network, an association of border criminals and smugglers that has mounted lethal attacks on foreign forces in Afghanistan. That confirmed long-standing U.S. mistrust about Pakistan's intentions. That swung the raging debate on whether President Barack Obama or another senior American should apologize. What does that have to do with apologizing to the Pakistani government? They already admit that this is border criminals. It's an association uh, of uh, the Haqqani uh, network. That is not tied to the Pakistani government. Okay, without the apology, Pakistan officials say they cannot reopen NATO supply routes into Afghanistan that have been closed since November. The Americans, in turn, are withholding between $1.18 billion and $3 billion of promised military aid. Hmm. Okay, and the United States have a habit of promising and not giving over. It's crazy. Can you see the manipulation going on here by the Taliban's uh, uh, on the behavior of the Americans and of the Pakistani government? Uh, they're like puppeteers playing the puppets and knowing what strings to pull to have them respond in one way or the other way. Uh, well, okay. If you would like to call and share an opinion, give us a call at 524 1080. Let's go to some music and uh, I'll be right back after this. Oh, oh, oh. 